So if we can all stand, everyone that's left here, <laughs> if we can stand, we're going to um, pray. And if you can remain standing, we're going to read from God's Word together. Father God, Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, for just the opportunity that we can get into your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive, and that it speaks to us where we're at, and Lord, we always need to hear it. It's refreshing, it's renewing, it's convicting at times. It's always perfect. It renews our soul. So we want to thank you for that. We pray that happens this morning. As we get into your word, we pray you would just talk to us, God, and we would hear you through your spirit. And Lord, each of us, each of us, Lord, however you want to speak to each of us, help us to get it, Lord, and to honor you through it. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw a star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. Thank you. You may be seated. of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And you are to show me shadows of the things that will happen in the time before us. Is that so, Spivy? Ghost of the future, I fear you more than any apparition I have seen. But as I know, your purpose is to do me good. And as I hope to be another man for what I was, I am prepared to bear you company. Will you speak to me? Night is waning fast, and I know that time is precious to me. Lead on, spirit, lead on! <laughs> Drama. <laughs> Today's message is called Overcoming My Ghosts of Christmas Future. We've been in the series I mentioned uh, for three weeks now. This is the third of the three weeks, and so we're concluding it today on how to overcome our ghosts of uh, Christmas past, present, and future. We've looked at the Christmas story in a particular way of how each of the different characters we looked at um, how they were plagued by, we'll say, ghosts. And by ghosts, we don't mean literal. We mean figuratively, you know, challenges in their life. Um, metaphorically, we're speaking about uh, maybe hurts or difficulties or pains that they had to deal with, either from their past or their present. And now we're going to be talking about maybe ones that had to deal with the future. Uh, last week, we talked on the, uh, dealing with the ghosts of Christmas uh, present. And we looked at, particularly, we looked at the life um, of Joseph, um, the earthly father of Jesus. And we looked a little bit at Zechariah too, the father of John the Baptist, and how they encounter their ghosts of relational and personal character challenges, but how they were able to overcome. And we got principles from that. And today we're going to be focusing on just those things that can maybe keep us up at night regarding our future. That's what we're dealing with today. Those things that can challenge us, that maybe if we let them, they can really come maybe even overwhelm us a little bit with fear. Cause us to be afraid of what's coming up. We're going to be looking at an unusual character in the Christmas story. Somebody that was actually had played a key part, an unfortunate part though. We're going to be looking at King Herod. And how his fears played a significant, although unfortunate role in the Christmas story. And we're going to look at three ways that we can overcome, face, and deal with that, that terminal, that we, well, hopefully we can deal a terminal blow with our quote unquote ghosts or fear 
of the future. And so that's our, that's our goal. Mark Armstrong is a cartoonist, and he put together a list of 12 things that we could possibly fear at Christmas. Uh, I listed a few of them. He's, he said this. One, let's say you fear the fact that you've, you're going to finish putting the lights on the tree, and you discover that you did it backwards, and the plug you need to plug in is up at, at the top of the tree. No, I, I, has anyone ever done that? Guilty, I have done that. All right, I'm not alone. Okay, good job. Yes. He said, you fear that, you're, well, you're watching It's a Wonderful Life again, if you remember that with George Bailey. And you see that Uncle Billy is putting the $8,000 back in the newspaper and you realize with horror, oh no, he's making the same mistake again. You come out of the store, there's a Salvation Army kettle, and it's ringing, and you pretend that you don't see it, and uh, you hope they're not noticed, and then he, the man ringing the bell yells out, a great Merry Christmas, your direction, and you just hide your head. You fear that Yule log that you ordered that's supposed to burn for 12 days and 12 nights won't fit in your fireplace. You fear that you'll get into a time machine, go a thousand years into the future, and you discover that no one knows who Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is and that he did not go down in history after all. <laughs> when it comes to facing your ghost of Christmas future, what would you say your ghost would be? Remember, we're talking about those possible things in the future that could make us anxious or afraid, possibly. What would you say your ghosts or fears could be right now? Maybe you're afraid about how it's going to go when all the family shows up and how they're going to hang out and interact with one another. Maybe you've been watching the news and you're afraid of what this next year has in store. Maybe our second economy or inflation has cost uh, so much great, you know, for you that you're afraid that you have to, buy, you know, buying all these Christmas presents, how are you going to be able to afford that, pay the bills? You know, January is coming. There's so many different kinds of possible fears that we have to deal with with regard to the future, aren't there? So how do you properly and how do I properly face them so we don't, let, we don't let them to get the best of us, how do we actually even overcome them with victory? Remember, it is possible. We've looked at Romans 8.37 for the last couple of weeks, which simply says that in Christ we are more than conquerors to Christ who loves us. But what does that look like? And how does the Bible define that as far as particularly dealing with our fears? Because when we're talking about dealing with our ghosts or figurative concerns of the future, we are talking primarily about fears, anxieties, that sort of thing. So how do we deal with that? You know, the Bible describes fear. It comes to Greek, has the Greek word phobos. And from phobos, we get the, car, the word we nowadays have as called phobia. It comes from the Greek word phobos. And phobos can be defined in this fashion. A state of severe distress aroused by intense concern for impending pain, danger, evil, or possibly by the illusion of such circumstances. In other words, fear. So fear of the future does not even require a real or actual cause for the fear. It just needs to be something we think is a possible future reality to cause us personal stress. And we get worked up about it. That's fear. Now, unfortunately, fear over possible negative future outcomes can really end up causing us and other people great harm if we don't handle the fears properly. How? How should we handle them? How do you deal with them properly? How would you do, deal with them in a way that honors our God? Well, we're going to look at Herod the Great. We mentioned that. He was the Judean king when Jesus was born. Uh, there were a lot of Herods, a line of Herods that came after him. He was considered maybe the first and the greatest uh, king, uh, King Herod. Um, he had a relationship actually with Caesar Augustus. Um, that is partially how he had the role that he had. But in reality, King Herod was, was, he was, had, was half Jewish. He was also half Edomian or Edomite 
which in itself really discounted him from being able to be on the throne of Israel. He was not a full-out Jewish king. And that made him vulnerable, and that also made him fearful of losing his position. In fact, he became ruthless. Catholic.com just stated it this way. As Herod's reign progressed, he became increasingly paranoid and unstable. There were indeed plots against him, and those around him manipulated his fears to their own advantage, leading him to lash out violently, including against members of his own family. King Herod ended up ex executing one of his most favored wives. He had nine. But one of his most favorite ones, he actually put her to death, along with three of his sons, including two of her sons, and also the crown prince, the one who was supposed to be for the longest time to succeed him in the throne. He had him executed just five days before King Herod himself died. So which means the, the man, King Herod, was controlled by his fears all the way to his death. Fears can be that way, can't they? Herod's violence and out-of-control behavior found it, his, its source in his fear of either losing the crown or maybe by someone trying to put him to death. It led to paranoia and mass murder. Unfortunately, we know the story. If you don't, of course, what we're going to look at today. He ordered the death of little boys, two years old and under, in and around Bethlehem. Authorities speculate that was probably about 32 little boys, children or babies. And that wasn't the only time he ordered mass murder. There are other times as well. A lot's been written about him outside of the Bible. If you want to know more about King Herod, you read Josephus, who was a, both a Jewish historian and later and a Roman historian, had a lot to say about Herod, Learn a lot about him. Now, after learning the Messiah, as the Bible account describes, how he was to be born in Bethlehem, what happened was God had provided these wise men, you know, if you know the story, how they came, they, he had, they, his, well, what they knew to be the star of the Jewish king had rose in the east, which indicated he's going to be born. And so they came to Bethlehem, because, I mean, uh, Jerusalem, because they knew he was going to be born in Judea, but they didn't know where. And since Jerusalem was the capital of uh, Judea, they went to uh, Jerusalem to find out maybe where the exact location would be where this Messiah was to be born, the king of the Jews. And when they did that, um, of course, we know that Herod found out from them that uh, he was, uh, this Messiah had been born, and he asked them to go, you know, he, he got the scholars to tell him where it was prophesied, where this Messiah was to be born. They said it was going to be Bethlehem. So then he told that to the wise men. He said, go and worship him, and then come back and tell me where he's at. And he had, unfortunately, a devious plan to go and have the Messiah killed. That was his plan. He was going to try to nip it at the bud and eliminate the threat before it became a real threat. But God had warned Joseph through a dream about Herod's intention and said to flee to Egypt. And so Joseph immediately obeyed and took Mary and Jesus with him. And they went to Egypt till Herod died. I basically just summarized to you uh, Matthew chapter 2, the first part. But the key part here is this. Herod's incredible and intense paranoia of losing the throne and maybe in his own life. A lot of times, some of it might have been a little bit valid. Most of it was not in any way close to being valid. But it led him to do tremendous, tremendous damage. And, and it can do that to us. Fear has that possibility over us. Fear can lead us to do terrible things to ourselves and to other people. Let's look at three ways that fear can have a devastating impact on ourselves and others. One, first of all, by the way, hopefully when you came in, you received a program, and in the program there should be a, a fill in the blanks, and you can do that right now if you want. First thing that fear can do to us, it shows that how it can harm us. Fear can harm me or others. This is how. Fear can immobilize me. Fear can immobilize me. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 3, it says, King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this about the Messiah, the King of the Jews being born, as, it, as was everyone in Jerusalem. And what I want to do right now, I want to zero in that very last phrase, as was everyone in Jerusalem. I was, that's interesting. Why would the people of Jerusalem be afraid? 
given the fact that their promised Messiah had, been, had come, you'd think they'd be excited. But in reality, that wasn't the case. Why? Well, because they didn't have, did not have an opportunity uh, to be excited about their future king because they feared their current king. They knew that when Herod was upset, people tended to die. Yeah. And often were innocent people. And they didn't want it to be themselves or any of their families. And so when he got disturbed, an unhappy king meant an unhappy life for the rest of us. In fact, they even talked about that in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 2. It says, the king's fury is like a lion's roar. To rouse his anger is to risk your life. And they knew that. They'd seen that in Herod. And so because of that, he was disturbed and that immediately made them disturbed and intimidated because they were afraid that something was going to be bad was going to happen with an unhappy Herod. And in fact, his, it did lead to something terrible, didn't it? And we all can let our fears of possible negative future outcomes intimidate us and immobilize us from acting as we should. Can't we? So a fight versus flight. And too often our flight is just not do anything. Pretend that we not see anything. I see nothing. For example, we know, we know where we're at, situation, our world needs our Savior's coming. He gave different indicators. And we know we need to be sharing Jesus like we've maybe never, maybe never shared him before. And yet we can be intimidated by that. We're afraid to open, inviting folks to church. We're afraid to even just bring up spiritual things because we're afraid they might react negatively. We let our fears control us and it immobilizes us. There's a story of a Christian man who rode the bus to work every day. And uh, he, was also, he was active in his church and he was a part of a men's group. And this men's group was in a uh, series of learning how to share their faith and, and trying to get excited and involved. And he, and he, he realized that um, every day he had been riding the bus and he had never shared his faith. And so he was, you know, convicted by that. And so he made a personal commitment to God. He said, okay, Lord, tomorrow, no matter what, I'm going to share my faith in Jesus with whoever I sit next to. Well, he got on the bus, he looked for a place to sit, and there was only one spot open. And it was next to, next to this big, huge, burly guy, biker guy, tats everywhere, scary, you know, beer. Everything was just like, and he's like, oh my goodness. And immediately his boldness went down to timidity and he just hung his head in shame because he knew he was not going to honor his commitment to God and he was just ashamed. He couldn't even look at the man. And all of a sudden, halfway through the ride, the man just started bursting down in tears and crying and heaving. His shoulders were heaving. Ah! like crazy he's like and the man the Christian man is afraid to even look at him he's, he starts crying God I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm a sinner I'm terrible I'm a sinner I'm a terrible sinner he's just crying like crazy help me I'm sorry and, and he starts and he turns over that small Christian man next to him he starts shaking him by the shoulders I need God I need God can you tell me how can I get Jesus in my heart tell me tell me and the man just looked at him and then he said a quiet prayer Lord is this a sign I should talk to him about you <laughs> We can do that, can't we? We can let fear immobilize us, can't we? It's so easy to do that. And in some ways, there's some wisdom in it. We don't want to just cause challenges unnecessary. But we also know what God wants us to do. And when he wants to do something, we got to do it, right? With faith and boldness. And even when we're, when we're immobilized by fear, we can miss the most obvious signs. Well, there's another harmful thing that can occur through our fear when we let fear get the best of us. And that is fear. Here it is. Fear can enrage me. Do you know that one? People aren't as aware of this one a lot of times. But if you think about it, it can. That certainly was the case with Herod. Now look with me at Matthew chapter 2, verses 16 to 18. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. And so, and we mentioned psychologists, of course, say when we encounter uh, threatening, challenging situations, uh, we can, what would happen is those are fearful situations. We can do the fight or flight. The flight, would, immobilizing is an example of that. The fight's the other side. That's the anger side. That's maybe what happens 
when we are faced with fearful situations and it upsets us because we know what could happen and we're angered by it. And we don't want it to happen. And so we get really angry that this could really happen. And so we get so upset and we lash out and we act and we overreact and we don't act properly in a way that honors God. It can enrage us, can it? Fear can enrage us. Harry did, didn't he? He knew that this was baby being born was a threat to his throne. So we arranged. It said, remember, it said he was furious. His fear led to his great rage and anger. And as a result, he had all these babies and children, little young boys killed. That's, I mean, incredible, terrible, terrible brutality. And that's what anger can do to us. Our fears can lead to uncontrolled anger. Look with me at uh, James chapter 1. <laughs> Verses 19 to 20. It says, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. I tell you, this, I think about this verse quite a bit. A lot of times people say, Oh, I'd be angry, but don't sin. And that scripture does say that. Ephesians says that. But man, I'll tell you what, I'm a human being and I, I really relate more to that James 1 passage. I know my anger probably is not going to result in something good. And so it's best for me just to keep it under control. Obviously, Herod could have learned that. But one of the problems, of course, with our, what causes anger is our fears. And right now we see ourselves living in unstable times. Observing that alone can produce a fear that can lead to an unrighteous, unrighteous anger. We see that. We see so much terrible things happening in our country and our world. Unrighteous anger being displayed. But look with me at Psalms chapter 37, verses 7 and 8. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Look at this. Stop being angry. Turn from your rage. Look at this. Do not Lose your temper. Why? It only leads to harm. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So fear can immobilize me. It can enrage me. There's one more harmful effect of fear that we're going to look at today, and that is that fear can mislead me. It deceives me and it misleads me. Bottom line is our fears of things can cause us to misread the situation, or misunderstand the situation. The old phrase, I appreciate an old song by Keith Green said, and when my fears become so oversized, amen. We can be so focused on what bothers us, concerns us, or, or causes us fear, it becomes oversized. And we, we, we can totally misread something, right? Can't we? And then we end up doing something stupid, and we have to ask forgiveness later, don't we? Are, we, are you with me? Are you with me? Fear, if we let it, can mislead us, deceive us into doing stupid things. And so, obviously, that's what happened with Herod. I mean, it was, I mean the epitome of terrible what he did with the children, right? Matthew 2, 16 to 18, Herod was furious, right? When he realized that the wise men had outwitted him, he sent, his, sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem were two years old and under. Based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance, Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A cry was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeps for her children, refusing to be comforted, for they are dead. I mean, wow. It's fulfilled a prophecy by Jeremiah years before, centuries before. That had, been, had an immediate fulfillment a little bit when the people of Israel were led into captivity in Babylon, but this had a greater fulfillment right now during the time of Christ. Rachel, where she was born, that was right by where Bethlehem was, the same general area. This was a total prophecy about Herod's killing of the children. That's what this is here. It's crazy. And fear can mislead us. We can fear often wrongly possible negative future outcomes, and so we get misled into making more, or excuse me, poor, or just honoring decisions to God or other people. 
I remember just recently, Sherry and I became aware of a family member of a close friend of ours in Washington. They took in a grandchild. That grandchild, unfortunately, suffered psychologically from paranoia and fear. And as a result, they, that grandchild ended up killing their grandparents and themselves. Just happened a few months ago. Utterly and completely tragic. But that's what fear does. It can deceive us. These were actually Christian people. They took their grandson and everyone else had rejected because they loved him. But his paranoia and fear misread the situation and, and he did what he did. Well, that's what fear can do. Here's the question, though. What can we do? What can, we, what can be done to overcome these things? How can we overcome our fears, our ghosts of Christmas future? Well, here's how. Let's look at um, a few little quick examples. First of all, while fear immobilizes me, love encourages me. Now, look at the word encourage there. Notice I have a hyphen. That's obviously intentional. And the implication is... If I let my fears of the future problems take over my thoughts, I'm going to become immobilized. But if I let God's perfect love take over and control me, if I, if I let God's love take over, so I'm focusing on his, his love for me and then letting him love others through me, what that does is it encourages me. It brings courage in my life where before I can't do it, but if I focus on God's love for me and letting him, him flow through me with his love, it gives me the courage I can't have on my own. Love does that. It's incredible. Look with me at 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. We know how much God loves us, and we put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him, face God, with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear. This is where we're getting deeper. Because look at this. Perfect love expels all fear. If we're afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Now, perfect love casts out, and this translation says expels, same thing, expels out all fear. Why? Because John said here, if we have an inordinate fear, of, first of all, let's say our fear of God. We're afraid of God, so we don't want to face him. Understand why? Because maybe we're aware of sin, and we're aware of our sin, and so we're afraid of facing God because we're afraid of the punishment of God's wrath that might be poured out against us. And there's truth. God does punish sin. We'll talk about it in a moment. We're afraid of hell, etc. But here's the deal. When we know Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we receive him in our hearts. We understand he loves us. And we no longer have that, have that fear of punishment anymore. In fact, it gives us in confidence. It gives us courage. Perfect love casts out all fear. By experiencing God's perfect love personally, we can then be spared from his coming judgment because it's going to happen to everybody. One, one thing's going to happen. Judgment, God's ultimate judgment. We're either in or out with him. But everyone who knows Jesus has received his love in his heart, in our hearts. Everyone has. We have no, we, God promises us we're not going to endure the negative side of judgment. We're going to have his wonderful uh, forgiveness. We're, we're going to have heaven. We're going to be with him forever. That gives us confidence. That takes away all the fear of punishment away from us. And also, when we don't fear God's judgment anymore, what also happens is I then receive his, his love and his mercy and it flows through me. And now I'm getting more confident in loving other people. In fact, I can love them as I let God love me more. I'm letting God love others through me more. And as that happens, my love for others becomes more perfect because my love from God is becoming more perfect. And as that happens, I, be, I no longer fear how people are going to react to me because I know what I'm doing is out of love for them. And so I don't worry about what they're going to do to me. I'm only caring about them. Are you with me? So perfect love casts out all fear. Amen? Amen. That's what it does. And that's what John is telling us here. God's telling us through John. So while fear can immobilize me, if I love as God wants me to love through God's love, that encourages me. That gives me courage. Another thing that 
about fear, how to overcome it is while fear misleads me, obedience directs me. Well, fear misleads me, obedience directs me. Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Get up. Flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. Herod was, was misled, as we know, by his fear and his anger, to commit that terrible atrocity of of infanticide. But Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus, on the other hand, was committed to obeying God. And so God directed Joseph's steps. And that's what the Lord does. He directs our steps as we obey him. Joseph obeyed him perfectly every single time. The Bible describes when he was afraid of, we talked about this a, a week ago, when Joseph was afraid to marry just Mary because he didn't know that he, sh- he thought she had given up her virginity. Well, you can re- watch next last week's if you want to online. But God honored his desire to honor God and do what was right. And so told him, hey, he told him through a dream, angel in a dream. Hey, she is still a virgin. Go ahead and marry her. Call him Jesus. And, Jesus. and then Joseph did exactly that statement. And when God had sent this angel to appear to Joseph here because of Herod's desire to kill the children, it said, as soon as God gave him that dream, it said, Joseph immediately got up, took the mom, took Mary, took Jesus, and immediately fled to Egypt. So Jesus, Joseph obeyed perfectly. God directed his steps because he obeyed perfectly. And, and, and that's the promise for us. We don't have to fear. We have the promise of God's help. And that's our last point. While fear enrages me, trust helps me. While fear enrages me, trust helps me. Psalms 37, 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust Him, and He will help you. Trust God, and He will help you. Look at that. Trust Him, and He will what? Yes, yeah, a little fast. Let's do a little bit louder. Trust God, and He will help you. Yeah, absolutely. Joseph trusted God's direction every time the Lord then helped him all the way through. Trusted God's word, and the same thing for us. As we trust God, he will help us. Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother. The angel said, stay there until I tell you to return because Herod is going to research for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary and his mother and they stayed there until Herod's death. It went on to say that little after Herod died, then God had an angel appear to Joseph in a dream again. He said, okay, come back up because the people seeking to kill the child is dead. So he obeyed again. When I obey God, he helps me, he directs my steps. Listen, you and I have no control over what's going to happen in the future. Do you? We can't guarantee we're going to be alive tomorrow morning. Amen? Amen. Can you? Because I can't. All we have is Him. And because of that, but here's the deal, that's all we need. Right? And so, as I trust Him and follow Him and obey Him and honor Him and love, like, let Him love me and let Him love others through me, as I do what He asks, then, then He helps, he directs, he guides, he encourages. I mean, that's pretty good stuff, right? What I want to do is I want to summarize a little bit. We've Three weeks. Three weeks ago, we talked about how to overcome our ghost of Christmas past. We said that if we connect our past with faith, our faith connects our past pain to present hope and future joy. I just have to connect faith to my past pain and that gives me hope now for future joy. 
Last week when we talked about overcoming our, our present difficulties, we said that with God, he, God will redeem us, restore us, and renew us as we follow Him. Today we're talking about overcoming our ghosts of our fears of the future, and we do it by confronting them with love, obedience, and trust. Love encourages us, obedience directs us, and trust helps us. And when we do these things, we, over, we become victory, victorious over ghosts of past, present, and future. So what I want to do right now is I want to conclude this series with Scrooge, seeing him have victory over his ghosts in his life. Let's go ahead and do that. of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. Where am I? I'm in my own room. I'm not in hell at all. I haven't got any change. Perhaps it didn't happen after all. Perhaps it did. But I'm alive. Alive! I've got a chance to change, and I will not be the man I was. I'll begin again. I will build my life. I will live to know that I fulfilled my life. I'll begin today. Throw away the past. And the future I build will be something that will last. I will take the time I have left to live. And I will give it all that I have left to give. I will live my days for my fellow men. And I live in praise of that moment when I was able to begin again. I will start anew. I will make amends. And I'll make quite certain and the story ends on a note of hope on a strong amen and I thank the world and remember when I was able to Good enough. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. 
whole point is we have victory, right? That's the whole point. You know what's really cool is that God wants to grant you victory. Whatever you're dealing with. Dealing with past, dealing with present, dealing with future, ghosts, challenges, pains, heartache, fears. Let's have a time of prayer right now. And my question for you is, what, if you're honest between you and God, what ghosts, what fears, what challenges, what things have had you bound? Do you want to overcome them? That's what this series is all about. You can. Let's pray. Father God, you're an awesome God. Lord, we want to thank you that you help us to overcome. In fact, through you, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. That promise, no matter what we go through, no matter what we've been through, no matter what we may face in the future, we can be more than conquerors through you, through Christ, because of your great love for us. You don't abandon us. You encourage us. You help us. And Lord, I want to pray for every person here today. Lord, whatever the struggle they might have been dealing with, is there maybe heartaches, Lord, that they haven't given up in their past, and it's just, as it continues to affect their present and even maybe even their future. And that, to the point they, didn't want, they don't even want to deal with it. They just put it to the side. Or Lord, maybe even right now, Lord, right now they're dealing with something that's just painful. It's hurtful. Maybe, honestly, it's angering. And Lord, they don't know how to deal with it. They want to deal with it right. They're confronted by it. and Lord, they need your hope. And Lord, that leads into that next one, that ghost, that fear of the future. And what that might bring. And there's concern over that. There's fear. Even heartache. There's worry. And Lord, they need you. They need your encouragement. They need your instilling of your hope. They need your direction. They need your guidance. Oh, Lord God, they need you. Lord Jesus, right now I pray in the name, in your holy special name, that you would pour out your spirit even now. And friends, while we're praying to the Lord right now, I'm just going to ask if you do this in your own heart to God. Say, Lord, oh, Lord, I desperately need you to be listening to me right now. I'm dealing with this stuff. And if you would just pour out, is it the past stuff? And you haven't, oh, if you're honest, you haven't dealt with it right or all the way yet. Would you just talk to him about that right now? Deal with, talk to him right now about that. Because he hears you. It's amazing. God hears every one of us individually. It's just incredible. But that's who he is because he's God. So just talk to him right now about that. And right now, if you're just dealing with some anger issues right now, plagued by pain, maybe relational conflict, character issues, whatever it might be, financial challenges, could you just talk to him about that right now? Say, Lord, I want you to take this. I want to honor you in this. I want to accept your restoring and renewal. Lord, I need you to help me here. Change me. Even before you deal with the situation, change me. Would you pray that to him right now? And let's talk about that future thing right now. The future ghosts. The fears. The worries. The doubts. The concerns. Even rivalry. I just got that word rivalry, and I have no idea what that means. But if that means something to you, know the Lord Jesus is ministering to you right now. Lord God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to every one of us where we're at. 
Because we all deal with our ghosts, our fears, our worries, our pains, our hardships, our heartaches. And we need you to be Lord of all of them. God, minister right now. And every person here, in your own heart, in your own mind, in your own way, would you say, hey, Lord, I want you to be Lord of this. Whatever it is, whatever that ghost is, Lord, I want you to be Lord of this. Take over right now, Lord. Take over in my life and help me to overcome through Jesus right now. Lord, I want to overcome. I want to get past my past. I want to get, I want to even go beyond my present. Lord, I want to trust you for my future. Be the God that you are. Be the God of my life. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. We exalt you, Lord God. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't God good?